What's up y'all, it's Shuffle, and we're going to do a guide for the Shroud in Darkest Dungeon 2 today. So I'm going to explain how the entire region works, what the enemies can do, the boss, the trinkets, and some good characters to take with you if you want to go to the beach. First of all, I want to give a huge shout out to Minoru for becoming a YouTube member. Thank you so much for the support. And if you want to become one yourself, click the link below or hit the join button and you can get a shout out in a video as well as some other perks. Starting off with themes for the Shroud, there are quite a few, but the most prominent ones will be the Fog. This happens in combat against Fisher folks. Really high damage across the board. This region hits pretty hard, almost as hard as the Tangle, which is kind of crazy. There are a lot of movement effects for yourself, and move resist is very important. There's a fair amount of bleed, and the enemies can buff themselves or each other. First enemy is the Humble Bosun. This is probably the most annoying enemy in the entire region because all it does is try to piss you off as a player because it will move you either back or forward depending on where they're standing and they can stun you if they are in the middle ranks themselves, so two or three. These normally aren't priority targets as annoying as they are unless they're in rank two or three, the mid ranks, because that's where they can hit you with sodden rigging, which is the stun, and you really don't want that to happen, so they don't take too much to take down, so if they're in the middle, make sure you go for them. Next enemy is Wharf Rat. It really isn't threatening at all, it's just kind of annoying. It can throw in some damage, and it's really just cannon fodder, so these are usually what get defeated last. One of the most lethal enemies in the Shroud is the Fishmonger. This is a very high priority target. She doesn't take a lot of hits to defeat, but she can give herself dodge, and she also likes to give herself crit while taking two turns. So the damage output of this enemy is very high. Don't let the dodge dissuade you, you should just try and hit through it as much as you can and defeat her first or second. The next enemy is Captain. Captain likes to buff all of its buddies if it is in the very back, rank 4. And most people think, oh, I should probably defeat this first, but in my experience, it's usually easier to defeat something up front and then get rid of the corpse and then let the captain slide up so it can't buff anymore. And captain himself has a bit too much HP to take down in like one turn efficiently. So usually I ignore these till later. Next is cabin boy. This is a very, very annoying enemy. This is the highest priority target. It is just a little bubble baby looking thing from the abyss and it will transform into a random shroud enemy on turn two if it gets to act. So what ends up happening is if there is only one spot, it will make itself a size one enemy as in it will replace itself. If there are two spots available, it can become a docker and that is very dangerous. So. They don't take too much to get rid of, so it's really good to go for these first and honestly just ignore everything else as best you can. The final normal enemy in the Shroud is Docker. This is a size 2 enemy that hits ridiculously hard and has quite a bit of HP. The most notable attack from Docker besides its massive damage is a move called Make Way, where Docker hits the entire team for a respectable amount of damage and randomly shuffles them. Make Way doesn't have a high chance of being used turn one, but the chance is not zero. So after turn one is usually when I start trying to prep for it, which is doing something like immobilizing your team or certain members on it, like Leper using Bash, for instance. And then after that, you can try and blind Docker. Mainly you want this move to do as little disruption as possible because it does some pretty massive disruption and once it goes off it has a very lengthy cooldown so you rarely see it more than once a fight. The two elite enemies in the shroud are Hull Keeper, which is an elite bosun and Admiral Marsh which is an elite captain. For Hull Keeper it is a more dangerous version of the bosun it has all the same gimmicks of movement and stun as well as a bit more damage and then finally, the ability to hit the entire team with Riptide. The other elite enemy, Admiral Marsh, is kind of forgettable, sadly. He doesn't even have death armor, like most other elites do. And for this one, 
He really plays the same as the captain. He sits in rank four. He can buff people. But now, since he's elite, he has a different move called prepare to board. And that can be used from rank three as well. So the priority kind of shifts a bit if you don't want to deal with these buffs. And prepare to board is really, really dangerous as well. Because it gives the chance of extra bleed damage on hit as well as strength, block, or speed. So you can see how this might be problematic. If your team has the reach and you feel that you don't want to deal with these buffs, then Admiral Marsh might be a good one to focus fire. It's time to talk about the boss of the Shroud, Leviathan, the Sea God. Most of us just call him Levi or Levi just as a shorthand. And for Leviathan, it is a really interesting boss. It is reminiscent of the capture bosses of Darkest Dungeon 1, like the Hag. So if you've fought that, then you probably have some understanding of where this is going. But unlike Hag and Fnatic, for example, Leviathan is capable of a bit more disruption as well as damage. The good part about Leviathan is there is not really that much randomness to the encounter besides damage, obviously. You have the mark that comes out for the capture targets, and then it has different abilities depending on if the hand is present and not present. So it's very predictable to tell what's going to happen and do your best to prepare for it. If there is no hand in play, so Leviathan's hand is underwater, the only attacks it will use are the breath, which is reminiscent of the fog because Leviathan is the source of the fog, so it's the same thing of blind, vulnerable, and stress, but it will not use this move if the hand is present. It will always do this on its first action if there is no hand, and since Leviathan has three actions per turn, the next one is Eyes of the Storm, which marks the two people that are going to be hit by Undertow on the following turn. This can be any two people on the party, but one of them will be in the front, so it's a little bit easier to predict in that front, but otherwise, it can be both your frontliners, one of your frontliners, and one of your backliners. So those are the only two possible combinations. For Leviathan's third action, it will summon its own hand at the end of the round, and that way, it's prepped and ready to abduct someone on turn two. Thankfully though, if you played in early access, the hand no longer gets a free instant action at the start of the turn after. It has its own speed that it has to deal with, so there's no instant undertow immediately setting you back. And there's a bit more counterplay to it now. The important thing to note about undertow is that it can only hit someone who is marked in the front of the party. So. If you have a way to prevent that person from being targeted or being captured at all, then it goes a long way in helping you efficiently clean up the fight. Very important to note, Undertow ignores dodge, blind, taunt, and immobilize. A lot of people think you can immobilize this attack. You cannot. What it checks for is your movement resist. That makes paths like Sergeant, Poet, for example, very good in this fight because they have high movement resist and can resist undertow. Man-at-Arms also has the great benefit of being able to guard the other marked person, which effectively just corrals the undertow attempts to him specifically. Undertow does have a cooldown, but it will try and use it every turn until it grabs someone. If you're very desperate to not get grabbed by undertow, then the last ditch defense that you can do is to move someone into the back ranks if they're marked. Leviathan can't grab you if you're in the back, but the hand has another attack called Batter. Batter can hit any rank as long as the person is marked, and it can do some hefty damage. The other thing it's capable of doing is shuffling you. So if it hits someone, even if they're marked in the back and no one's undertowed, it has a really good chance of just knocking them up front and then grabbing them after. Thankfully though, you can blind against batter as well as dodge, guard, or even stealth it. In some very rare cases, you'll see the hand pass a turn, and honestly, that's hilarious. When someone is captured by Undertow, they take 4% of their HP damage per turn, as well as gaining 2 stress a turn. The HP damage is honestly negligible until they melt down, because there's so much stress with being Undertowed that the HP doesn't really matter until they hit a meltdown and lose all of their HP from it. Something I greatly dislike about the fight too is that the moment you destroy the hand, 
and free your teammates. They come back up from Undertow, and a lot of chaos can happen, and your character does not get its turn back. So when you defeat the hand is actually really important. So make sure you're counting your damage, your damage over time effects, or whatever. The reason this is so threatening is because when Leviathan gets its turn, it can use Tidal Surge. So if your character comes up at the wrong time, they can get hit by Tidal Surge, take some damage, or if they're on Death's Door, they could even die. Tidal Surge is the Red Hook standard attack that hits everyone and deals stress just to put immense pressure on your party. And it does some really good damage. 3 to 7 is the base. This is ignoring vulnerable. This is ignoring crits, which makes it very, very lethal after getting your team battered and Eyes of the Storm hits for an okay amount of damage. Then Tidal Surge comes in and it makes this fight very, very high pressure. Ultimately, though, that's the entire fight. It's just a cycle. It's the Breath, Eyes, Summon Hand phase. And then there's the other phase, which is... Undertow, Batter, Batter, and Tidal Surge. Those are the only attacks you'll see. You will always see them in that order. So as I said before, the fight is a bit predictable unless something goes critically wrong, like people start getting shuffled all over the place or die early. Because this fight puts out so much damage and honestly stress as well, you don't want to take too long on it. Ideally, you only want to go through maybe three rotations of the hand, make it a six, seven, eight round fight and no more because after that, you're either having chain meltdowns or people are starting to die. You're able to beat Leviathan, you get the normal boss loot of some trinkets, money, baubles, and stuff, but there are two trophies that are really interesting. The first is the Lashing Tides. This is a trophy that allows you to stack two more combat items on a hero. So it doesn't matter if the limit is normally one or two or four or whatever, you can have two more than that and that can be really really good because some combat items are very strong and they are balanced around the fact that you can't use them more than once or twice. This trophy is just universally good especially if you have stagecoach gear that is capable of producing items. The other trophy is beck and call and that is one that's really interesting a bit tough to pull off and normally doesn't benefit you but if you can turn it into an upside it's pretty awesome. The trophy increases bleed damage for both sides. Bleed damage you deal, bleed damage you receive, it doubles it. This is really good for bleed heavy characters like Hellion. If you happen to score a mastered bleed out crit, it is an extra 60 damage in just the bleed plus the on hit damage and that is very destructive. The flip side of this is bleed is a very very common damage over time type. The cultists use it for example, and there is at least one confession boss that likes to use it, so having this can be very detrimental in a lot of cases, especially because if you put this on to get to the mountain, the first two cultist fights you deal with have bleed, so you have to be very, very careful if you choose to use this. The Shroud, thankfully, has some of the best region trinkets in the game, so if you want to go put up with these shenanigans, then you can get some really cool stuff. The first is the sweater, Sodden sweater. This comes from Levi. It has 50% bleed res and 50% move res. If you resist a bleed effect, you heal 10% of your life. If you resist a movement effect, you heal one stress. The sweater is a nice trinket to have just because bleed is very common. Movement is somewhat common. So if you have a frontliner or just someone you don't want getting hit by bleed, then throw it on them. The next Leviathan only trinket is Carved Bodkin. This is an interesting one because it gives you an extra turn, or I should say extra action, which is normally a very powerful effect. The trouble with this trinket is getting it to line up because it reduces the bleed amount you receive by two, so you have to get a bleed that's like three or more stuck to you. And if you are bleeding on your turn, you have a chance of getting an extra action at 20%. Overall, extra action trinkets are incredibly strong, even this one. But in terms of that power level compared to other extra action trinkets, I would say it's a bit on the lower side, only probably better than Pocket Watch. The next indelible trinket that can show up in the Sprout is the Fisherman's Line. This one is cool, a little hard to pull off if you have a Fisherman Net, which isn't as common as you think it would be. Then every time you hit something, you have a 15% chance to stun it. This is actually super good. 
If you have a serrated item instead, you have a 50% chance of bleeding them for 3 damage. Pretty okay, not the best. I'd rather have the stun. The other indelible trinket is one of my favorites, and that is Nautical Compass. This has about a 20% chance to either give you stress on your turn end, or block, crit, dodge, and strength. Or I should say, or strength. So you get one of those five effects, and most characters honestly appreciate any of those. So it's a really good universal trinket to put on people. The Shroud mid-tier trinkets, or distant trinkets if you want to call them that, the blue ones. There are five of them, and the first is Clasp Knife, which I have trouble saying, but it gives you 25% bleed chance, very nice to have, and if you yourself are bleeding, it's minus 5% crit. Still a really good trinket if you have a bleed character with no other source of bleed penetration. The next distant trinket is Leather Strop, which increases bleed duration by 2. So this is really good just as a general damage spike, and most bleeders appreciate having it. The minus disease res on bleed is completely negligible because we all know that disease sticks 100% of the time. The third trinket is Pristine Lure, and a lot of people that I've talked to really like this trinket. It's a chance of giving you one dodge or two dodge or nothing, and if you miss the target, you get to bleed. I personally don't like this trinket. I think that some of your tank characters like man in arms if you have a post you know you're taunting yourself to try and keep all the attacks on him if your post misses you have a chance of bleeding yourself and sometimes you don't want that much taunt you can't turn this effect off so there will be times where it keeps proccing and the same person keeps getting hit in the face and you can't keep up with the recovery and then people are in danger the fourth trinket is Fishmonger's Gloves, obviously come from the Fishmonger, but any enemy drops them. But for this trinket, if you have a serrated item, which isn't as common as you'd think, you have a 33% chance of adding an extra bleed point of damage. If you also have a serrated item equipped, then you get 33% bleed res piercing, this is really good. And then if you miss, you have a small chance of bleeding yourself. The upsides on this trinket are really good for any bleed heavy character that you want to use, but the flip side of that is most of the bleed paths like Berserker and Soloist and even Yellowhand indirectly get bleed res piercing, so it's not as useful as you'd think. The final shroud trinket is Seaman's Boots, and these are pretty cool. A little tough to get value out of because you have to be either two or less speed or six or more speed, which is kind of hard to pull off for a lot of people. A lot of characters like to sit at three, four, or five speed, so they just don't get the bonus. But if you move and you're slow, you get a chance of a block token, and if you move and you're fast, as in moving positions, you get a chance of a dodge token. This can be really cool for dance teams. Virtuoso Jester really likes these. Some Highwayman builds, some Grave Robber builds, and now probably even some Duelist builds like this. To wrap up the video, we're going to talk about the best heroes to take to the Shroud. You can make anyone work, honestly, but these are characters I feel have a bit more value. The first is Runaway. Pretty obvious, I would assume. It's because Runaway can cure Bleed with Cauterize, she can cure Blind with Hearthlight, she can blind enemies with Smokescreen, she can move herself in and out of positions, she can go into Stealth to dodge Undertow or Batter, and her damage over time effects are pretty good against the boss. Controlled Burn can sit on whatever position, usually the front, and just all these extra turns the boss and the hand get, it stacks controlled burn very quickly, so it puts out a lot of damage. And Runaway herself does pretty good in terms of like single target burn damage. Another good character to take is Highwayman. He has a lot of great damage options from any position, and if you use take aim in tandem with that, you can cure the blinds that might come your way, and then, you know, a crit point blank shot can take out the hand in one turn. Or if he's in any other position, he can just do a lot of good range damage. Man in Arms, another amazing character to take to the Shroud. All of his paths have important skills like Defender and Hold the Line. These can help deal with the disruptions of the enemies and guarding marked targets. So if someone gets hit by eyes, then you can guard them, prevent them from undertow. And he also has a really awesome path for the Shroud, and that is Sergeant. Sergeant gives Man-at-Arms move immunity, so he will never ever get taken by Undertow, 
and it has the chance of buffing the other teammates for resistance. Get an extra 50% bleed resist from a teammate, and that can really help mitigate a lot of the damage. Sergeant is so good for Leviathan, it almost trivializes the boss. So if you want to do that very, very dangerous and honestly not suggested Region 1 Leviathan, you can get Sergeant Man-at-Arms and like Bounty Hunter, then it should be a pretty manageable encounter. The downside of Sergeant is you do need to put a lot of damage on the team to back up his lack of damage. Finally, for those of you with the Binding Blade DLC, I will suggest Crusader. Crusader is pretty healthy, which is nice. He can heal, stress heal, those are always nice things to have. He can guard on one of his paths, he can take some hits, he has regeneration. And then he has some pretty solid damage options from whatever rank. If he's in the back, Holy Lance, good one to have. If he's up front, Smite does some okay damage, especially if they're comboed. And there's some other little synergies that he has depending on the path, as well as he pairs very well with Runaway. All right, y'all, that's going to do it for the video. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Let me know what you're thinking down below in the comments. Are there any other tips you want to help out with the new players, strategies that worked for you, or questions you may have? The next region guide will be the Fetter, and we'll do the Sluice eventually. And after that, that will be the end of region guides until we get another one. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.